I'd say taking a new vision of your staff. That to me is the, probably the most important thing I did that really allowed me to, as you say, scale. So hiring better, you know, hiring people that are, I have all college graduates as my staff, and then, you know, paying them more than comparable salaries, salaries that are better than most of my competitor practices in town. And then doing all the uh, sort of emotional quotient things, the EQ things to keep them and retain them. Because if your front desk or your, or your billing office or whatever is a revolving door, your practice will always be treading water. It won't grow. So keeping people and having them around for a long time frees me up to be able to do the higher level thinking, to do marketing things that I you know, wouldn't have normally time for, and to just not be so tired at the end of the day from seeing patients that I can't do anything else. You're listening to How I Scaled My Aesthetic Clinic, the podcast where the most high-performing owners of aesthetic clinics and med spas from all over the world tell their stories and share the strategies and insights that allowed them to grow their business from often humble beginnings to soaring success. If you've ever tried to build a clinic, you'll know that it takes a lot more than just being a great doctor or practitioner, and it helps when you learn from the best in the industry. So join me, Miriam Shaviv, host and director of content at Brainstorm Digital, as we explore how aesthetic clinic owners just like you have developed the mindset, skills, and experience to transform their businesses, and how you can do the same. Let's jump in. Dr. Manjula Jagasothi is founder and CEO of the Miami Skin Institute. In addition to being known for its natural results approach, her practice is also known for its extraordinarily loyal staff. Most people on her team have been with her for many years. Born in Sri Lanka and raised in Pennsylvania, Dr. Jagasothi follows in the footsteps of parents and grandparents who were all physicians. She has her own degrees from both Harvard and Yale universities and is Associate Clinical Professor of Dermatology at the University of Miami Frost Department of Dermatology. Dr. Jagasothi has been on the editorial panels for aesthetic dermatology and skin and aging for a number of years and has an extensive profile in both local and national media. Today, we're going to discuss how she built such a successful practice from scratch and especially focus on how she attracts and retains a top team. Let's dive in. Dr. Manjula Jagasothi, welcome to How I Scaled My Aesthetic Practice. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Absolutely, our pleasure. Um, so I understand that you are the daughter of two physicians, is that right? Yes, my father was actually a very well-known dermatologist. So not only was I steered toward medicine, I was kind of also steered toward dermatology uh, from kindergarten on. So I used to go to AAD meetings since I was about three or four. <laughs> so I've been in it for a long time. So I guess a lot of kids see what their parents do and really want to go the opposite direction. Like my kids always tell me they would absolutely never, ever, ever want to do what I do. Um, but it didn't seem to affect you like that. But you, you actually seem to want to do what, what your parents did. Is that right? Well, I also think that's partly sort of um, a South Asian uh, you know, cultural thing that, you know, the parents, I, I'm married to a Caucasian American guy and uh, he's always like, whoa, your parents are so much more insistent than mine are, you know? And so I, th I don't know, you know, if that's part of it, but definitely Indian parents, and we're from Sri Lanka actually, but Sri Lankan parents, they kind of get what they want. <laughs> so it's not like you really can run the other way. <laughs> Resistance is futile. <laughs> yes, yes. Was there anything, though, growing up that you saw in the way that your parents um, operated and in their work that actually genuinely did attract you or, or ultimately really affected you? Um, well, I used to go with my father to clinic since I was a teenager, and I thought it was so interesting that he could literally just look at a rash and within two seconds diagnose exactly what was wrong with the patient and ask the patient questions about 
their life that had caused the rash or, you know, that influenced the rash, genetics, et cetera. And the patients would be shocked, like he was some kind of fortune teller and he knew their life, but it was really just, you know, his dermatologic knowledge. So I thought that was really cool. And I like the ability to be able to quickly fix people. I'm not big on chronic disease. And so a lot of dermatology and especially aesthetics is very acute. You, you do something and you see a result right away. So. I learned that from watching him. And I saw somewhere that you were, you also had an interest at the time in business. Is that right? Yes. Uh, I went to uh, Harvard College undergrad and, you know, at that time it was in the late eighties and it would, you know, sort of finance sector was having another big boom and particularly investment banking at that time. And so all of my friends were going, moving to New York and having glamorous lives doing that. And I was interested in doing that. But my father said, either you can go and do that and we won't pay you, pay, give you a dime ever again, or you can go to medical school and we'll buy you a condo and get you a car. So, so I was, was the, as I said, <laughs> resistance, was, resistance was futile, but I'm sure that running your own, your own practice, the, the business interest by definition must have come in really, really useful afterwards, but we'll get, we'll get that in a second. Tell me first of all, um, so you eventually you did decide um, to go into medicine. Um, what, what, was, what was your path there? What, what was that? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. What, what was your path there? Oh, um, so, you know, it's the traditional thing. If you're going, you do pre-med. And then I went to medical school in Pittsburgh. And it was nice because my family was there. And my father was a professor at the medical school there. So it felt like home. And, you know, taking care of patients is what it is. It, you know, it's wonderful. And people are so happy and you feel like you're really doing good and making a difference in the world. And that's really great. And then I went all over the country for my different training programs and uh, ended up in Miami for dermatology. And I spent one winter here. You know, I know I've heard, I don't know if you've seen the United States everywhere is below 30 degrees, except the Florida peninsula today where it's beautiful in 75. So uh, you know, so I stayed and, and it's been a wonderful thing doing dermatology in Florida because we're such an ethnically diverse community and such a sort of racially and skin color diverse community. So, And does your, does your practice reflect that? It's something, is that something that you have um, kind of con consciously tried to cultivate or it ju that, that just is what it is? Uh, I have tried to consciously cultivate it, but it is also what it is because in Latin America, you know, in the same nuclear family, you can have four people of varying skin types from, you know, Fitzpatrick one to Fitzpatrick five. And I find that fascinating. And they don't even consider themselves mixed race or biracial or any of the terms we, we use in the United States. And so that has given me a diversity of practice that I didn't even have to go for. But then once I saw it was happening, I definitely tried to, you know, market so that everyone would know I can treat all skin types. A lot of people don't know that darker skin types are actually more difficult to treat than lighter skin types. So being darker skin myself has helped a lot. So do you think that, um, have you chosen specific treatments, you know, in order to, um, you know, really for that reason? Has that really influenced the way that you've actually developed the practice? Absolutely. In the beginning, the lasers weren't very sophisticated. You know, I've been in practice now 22 years. So the very first lasers started then and now we're on 10th, 11th generation. Um, the first lasers really could only be used on lighter skin patients. And so those, as time has gone on, I've phased all of those lasers out of my practice. And I only use lasers that can be used on all skin types safely. You think that's something that most um, that most practitioners are really conscious enough of? Um, I, I think you know a lot of my peers who are kind of the top in their field definitely are because those lasers that can be used on all skin types also carry with them lower recovery times and you know less. Uh, adverse event profiles, you know, better, better uh, results and lower recovery. And then also, you know, patients don't have suffer as much with in the week after. And so it's a lot less hassle. So I think people are adopting that regardless, whether it's because of being in tune to diversity or not, you know, it's just better. So tell me a little bit about your practice and how you came to set it up right at the beginning, which is now quite a long time. <laughs> 
again, my father comes to the rescue. So, you know, I was working for someone and um, it was a very large practice, uh, mostly medical dermatology. And I found the aesthetic patients kind of flocked to me because I spend more time with people. I like to get to know my patients and that's kind of more conducive to an aesthetic practice because you're doing a procedure that takes a little while. You can talk to the patient while you're doing it and that sort of thing. And so a lot of the staff there was like, oh, you have to open your own practice, Dr. J. You know, it's, it would be great. People would love to come to a place that's less crowded than this and all of that. So I did that and my father funded Um, you know, and that was it. After that, you can't go back, really. <laughs> so what was your vision initially for your, for your practice? What did you want to build right at the beginning? Um, I, you know, I know that when you start, you have to kind of do medical dermatology and, and see everyone, see everyone who walks in the door. But as time went on, you know, it was my sort of feeling. I, I really liked aesthetics as it evolved. I just think it's, it's so exciting how in the last 20 years, it's become this huge field that's in popular culture, it's on social media, it's certainly on Netflix all the time, you know. So I, I kind of transitioned to that more than medical dermatology. And about 10 years ago now, I've, I've given up doing medical dermatology and I practice solely aesthetic dermatology. Okay. Um, where, where did your first patients come from? Uh, my first patients came um, because I did some advertising back then, believe it or not, in the yellow pages, uh, <laughs> saying that, you know, I had an, opened a new office. So a lot of my former patients came without my advertising to them or telling them anything. And then I opened in an area that was underserved in the sense it was a it was the Wall Street of Miami. It was the financial sector, but there were no dermatologists here. And so you know, <laughs> I to think that that could be true. I, I know, you know, Miami was not a big town 25 years ago. Uh, you know, it's not like it is now for sure. So you had the, the start, in many ways, you had the starter's advantage. Yes. And so you had, you know, and that's what most dermatologists still do. They go to a place where it's a little bit underserved and they hang up a shingle and people will come. It's a wonderful field in that way. When you think of how your practice has grown over all these years, what is the single most important thing that you did that really allowed you to grow the practice? I'd say um, taking a new vision of your staff. That to me is the, probably the most important thing I did that really allowed me to, as you say, scale. So um, what do you mean by that? So hiring better, you know, hiring people that are, I have all college graduates as my staff. Um, and then, you know, paying them more than co comparable salaries, salaries that are better than most of my competitor practices in town. And then doing all the uh, sort of emotional quotient things, the EQ things to keep them and retain them. Because if your front desk or your, or your billing office or whatever is a revolving door, your practice will always be treading water. It won't grow. Um, so keeping people and having them around for a long time frees me up to be able to do the higher level thinking, um, to do marketing things that I, you know, wouldn't have normally time for, and to just not be so tired at the end of the day from seeing patients that I can't do anything else, that I have time to even do a podcast like this, you know? How did you realize that the quality of staff and how long they stay with you um, was so important? Was there, a mo was there something that made you just realize that that's something that you really need to fix? The new well, it's funny. Yeah, the industry standard is such, it seems to be to me low and people don't realize, and I guess it's because they have large staffs and payroll adds up. But um, I saw that if I had one good person and you know, the practice would grow so much more. So I, I learned from experience, you know, and then after that, I decided, you know, about 10 years in, um, I should have all good people. <laughs> it seems pretty, it seems pretty, you know, that should be, you know, a, a habit or a, it, a, an instinct, but, you know, it takes experience to really learn that, I think. 
So how do you identify, first of all, how do you, what, what qualifies in your book as someone good? I mean, I guess depending on the role that they fulfill, you, you define that differently. But, you know, when you think of good staff, do you have any criteria there? Yeah, I think, you know, the most important thing, obviously, is honesty. You know, it's someone that you can trust. And, you know, they to, whether they're going to be managing your money, whether they're going to be managing your credentialing, whether they're going to be managing the marketing for the practice, you know, you, you delegate and you may not be able to check on their work. And you certainly can't check on all their work all the time. And so you need to be, I think, honest people are the most important thing. And then secondly would be a willingness to learn. Um, other people, lots of people have different personality types. So I've found that assembling a team of different personalities that complement each other is probably the best. So you don't want all people that are big talkers or all people that are big listeners. You, you want a combination of both and hopefully put them in the right places. I know my current uh, front desk manager he um, started in marketing because he wanted to be a marketer out of college. That was his ambition. So I hired him as a marketer and he's so much better talking to the patients and dealing with the, them on a daily basis than he ever was as a marketer. And he'll admit it. And so, you know, that's his. You had to be it. able to see that you had to be able to see that, that he was someone who you wanted to give a different opportunity to, I would imagine. Yeah, I, he's someone I wanted to hire. And then let's see where it goes from there. Let's see, you know, sure, I want to fulfill people's ambitions, but they should also play to their strengths. And a lot of people don't know their strengths right out of college. So really, you're not hiring for a role per se, you're really hiring the full, the full rounded person. Is that right? You're really Absolutely. The person who somehow fit. Is that, is that correct? I'm hiring for character, I guess you could say. Um, how do you identify that during what's your hiring process do you have how do you identify someone's character it's long <laughs> my hiring process is long um, first we have a, a very pointed telephone interview where we ask them you know questions they probably wouldn't be used to as, as being asked on the phone such as you know who's someone who's made a difference in your life who's someone whose life you have made a difference in uh, name the best thing you feel like you've done for the world you know, things like that, larger questions, and see how they answer them on the cuff. Um, you know, if they don't have an answer, that's okay. You know, they, they're allowed to, within two business days, write us a two-sentence answer, you know, so they have an opportunity if they kind of get scared on the phone. <laughs> um, then after that, we, had, we used to have them in. Now we do Zoom interviews, obviously. I haven't had to interview anyone during the pandemic. We, everyone in my staff is stayed put and we've all been fine but um but you know we'd have an interview and then you get into more sort of what their experiences and qualifications are in the personal interview and then after that they do working interviews where i pay them um what they're starting what i think their starting salary would be based on their skill set and then they work several days or a week, maybe two weeks with my current staff and whoever it is we're intending them to replace. That's another thing. If you hire people with good character, they're not just going to just quit and give you two weeks notice. They're going to want to give you some time and, and train their replacement. And that's another big, big way to be able to keep your, my life uh, available to be able to keep growing. That the person is essentially training their replacement. That I don't have to train them. Um, but it sounds like you're also giving um, your new recruits an on an on the job interview where you're actually seeing what what are you looking out for at that point? I would imagine that you're also looking for how they fit in with the team, not just how they do the job. Exactly. What their person you don't know what a person's personality is like in an interview, in a telephone or pers in person interview. You have to see how they react to stress when it gets busy at the desk or when it gets busy on the phones or when it gets busy, we have to do this post right now because it's timely on a, from a marketing standpoint. So you see how they react to stress is probably the most important thing in a working interview. Um, what I've also found is that most people don't pay on the working interview. And I found that that really helps um, people feel like they're, they are part of the team and whether they would fit in or not. It's, it's for them to interview us as much as us to interview them. 
And what about um, retention? Because you mentioned before that being able to retain the staff is also really, really important. So what, spe what special things do you do with your staff that you think really helps keep them on board? I mean, I involve them in all of our important decisions. You know, it, ultimately I make the decision, but I definitely ask them what they think. And I always entertain their feedback and you, you can ask them. I mean, they definitely know that they influence my decisions um, because if it's not good for all of us, it won't be good for any of us. And so I, uh, we always talk about everything. And so they probably feel more of a stake in your business as well. Yes, and they do have a stake. They're incentivized very nicely towards growth for our practice. When we hit certain numbers every week or every month, they get more salary or more or bonuses. And so, you know, they definitely feel like they have a stake. And I think that's important for retention. Do you think that, I would imagine that your patients pick up on this. There must be, it must have an impact on the atmosphere and, and their interactions with your staff members. Yes, I mean, my patients say it all the time that my office is the happiest place they go to in their day. And I think that that is so important, especially in an aesthetic practice, because they don't have to come and they're paying their own money to come and a lot of money <laughs> to come. And so it should be really nice and it should be really happy. And the staff should be extremely nice to them. And the only way you can get your staff to really be nice to the patients 24 seven is for them to be happy at the job 24 seven. How long on average do you retain them for? How long on average do you retain your staff for? Can you hear me? Sorry, I missed that last question. Um, how, how long? Um, this last group, I've, this last group I've had for seven years. Um, one of my current staff members uh, wants to be with his mom who is ailing, um, and so he might leave. And so that would be the first person who's left in seven years. But he hasn't left yet. He can't find a job in that town that he likes better. So we'll see. That's incredible, though, an average, not even an average, like they've all been with you for a minimum of seven years. Yes. When you, look at, you must know other practices, you know, when you look at the way that they treat their staff, obviously, this is a massive generalization, but what are the biggest mistakes that you see other practices make? I mean, I think they hire too many people. I, I, another thing about scaling for me has been keeping my staff numbers low so that I can pay each individual person more and not have these large numbers of people because not only does that become expensive, but then you can't pay people as well. You don't know them as well. And I think for my staff, knowing me and knowing how I operate and also learning from me, you know, they're all younger than me and just the way I balance my checkbook or the, the personal things I do have helped them in their personal lives. And I think they see me as a mentor in that way. And I feel like that's also helped them. So they want to continue for the ride, you know, and see where this grows and see what other new things I do, et cetera. So they also must feel that there are development opportunities within your practice. Cause a lot of the reason why obviously people move from practice to practice is sometimes for the, for the opportunities. So how do you make sure that each one of your staff members really has those development opportunities within what you're already doing? Because they're doing such good work. I have time to talk to them every day and have a meaningful conversation with them at least twice or three times a week. And that's how I know what they're thinking and what they want and what they want for the near future, what they want for the distant future. And that's the best way to know them. Hey, it's Miriam here again. During this break, I have a quick question for you. Could you use some more thread lifts patients? How about some more body sculpting patients? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, then we have two campaigns you can implement right now to generate new inquiries and bookings. The Threadless campaign is based on one we've run extremely successfully for three aesthetic clinics in Honolulu, LA, and London. So it's tried and tested on two continents and we've been refining and optimizing it ever since. But don't take my word for it. We've got a case study explaining exactly how the Threadless campaign works to bring in new patients and the kind of results it's generated. I've put the link in the show notes just head down there right now to grab your copy. And if you'd like to discuss how it can work for your clinic, my email address is in that document as well. 
We're also running a case study group right now for clinics that want to attract more body sculpting and skin tightening patients. We'll be working with you very closely to generate immediate appointments, both from new leads and from your existing patient list, and to create a body sculpting sales funnel that can bring in more high value appointments long term. To find out more about how it works, email me at miriam at brainstorm digital.co.uk. That's miriam at brainstorm digital.co.uk, and I'll send you the details right now. Now, let's get back to the show. So we've talked about the factor which has been, you think, so is the, the most essential in your growth. What's been the biggest challenge in growing your practice? I mean, again, I think that as your practice matures, you know, so does your back. And you can work a little bit less. You know, you can't see so many patients in a healthy fashion like you could 20 years ago. So I think the biggest challenge has been to be able to maintain my workload, you know, or to see fewer patients in a day and still keep the numbers up. Um, you know, again, aesthetic practices, aesthetic dermatology is an expensive uh, venture. It's expensive for the patients, it's expensive for us. And so, you know, that's always the challenge is making the numbers work and still keeping everybody happy. With your capacity, essentially. Yes, my capacity, my staff's capacity, the patients, you know, if, you, if you're paying $1,000 for a visit, you have certain expectations and you don't want to be seen and rushed through in 10 minutes. So how does that work? So I feel like also then hiring the right extenders who the patients feel comfortable seeing, you, you know, I'm always on site. Nobody, no patients are seen currently at my practice when I'm not on site. So, but they should feel comfortable with someone else doing the procedure because I usually start out doing the procedures and then I, I delegate them. So, you know, that's something else where you have to have really good staff for so that the patients feel comfortable. And then in that case, I spend less time with the patient because I'm doing another procedure in another room. And so you have to have staff who can talk to that, the patients and make them feel comfortable and known and loved in the same way that I do. So have there been, um, you know, I, I guess in a way that just puts a limit on your a natural kind of ceiling on growth. So is that something that you're, you know, that you're, that you're comfortable with and you're happy with that? Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily put a natural ceiling on growth because you can always raise prices, you know, and, and if you continue to deliver innovative treatments and, you know, develop better and better procedures and do things that are unique that nobody else in your city is doing, you will be able to, you know, command higher and higher pricing. If the, the better the quality and the better the value of the treatment, and that's a big thing, you know, that, that I consider a given, that I'm always the best injector, that my laser procedures are always the best, my results are always the best, and so then, you know, you can, you can still keep, keep the numbers to grow. That's a way to scale. So, okay, so scaling in terms of revenue. So let's talk about price for a second, because obviously, you know, the people are at the top of the field and, you know, they're, they're not afraid to, to charge the most for sure. Um, but there's all, you know, there's lots of people who are kind of slightly lower down who are afraid, you know, patients aren't going to come to me if I charge too much. So was that a mental barrier for you or not at all? I mean, I think that that is a very valid and, you know, that's an astute assumption. And I think that when you're mid, when you're early in your career, you can't charge that much. You're not known so well, but with experience and with time, that becomes one of the, the, the good things that happens to you organically is that you can charge more if, as you develop experience and, and the patients expect that and everybody expects that. It's the fruit of having done a good job diligently every single day for several decades. So was there a moment where you suddenly realized, you know what, I can charge whatever now? Uh, it wasn't a moment. It was something I've been working toward for a long time. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit. We talked, you talked about your team, but I know that you also, that you also like to be very, very hands on in terms of involvement in all kinds of things in the business, like 
marketing or probably HR or accounts or things like that. Things that other um, clinic owners at some stage like to be more hands off. Why do you feel that you want to be more hands on with those things? Is that a conscious thing? What, what, what's that about? I honestly can't imagine not having some knowledge of all the aspects of my practice. I think that that's some kind of weird sort of disconnect that a lot of physicians have that I think is crazy. Um, and, and that causes a lot of problems. I have a lot of friends who are mostly from the older generation, but who've had millions of dollars embezzled from them, from their staffs because they're not watching. And I just don't understand that. So that was something I saw when I was starting out and I made a vow that would never happen to me. And it only takes a few extra minutes every day to look over your numbers and to look over everything that your staff did and just do a quick overview. You don't keep it so that you have to do it monthly or that you have to do it weekly even. You do it every day and then it's easy to, to maintain. I look the social media posts that are made on behalf of me for my marketing efforts you know, it takes two seconds to go and look through them and make sure they're all all right. If you save them and you don't look at them for a week, then you have, might have something disastrous up there for a week that you didn't see. So right. here I can catch small errors and things right away and have the post taken down and redone. I just think it just needs to be a part of your practice, just like seeing patients. So to me, that sounds like your business, your interest in business really coming, coming out because um, that, that's essentially what you're saying, that you really have to understand all facets of your business, whereas a lot of clinic owners who don't have any business background and actually aren't really interested in it, um, you know, are, are more hands off with that. So is, is that, um, you know, is, is, is that your business background coming out, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think I've always been interested in all these other things as well. I, I'm interested in lots of things, you know, I was an anthropology major, I like archaeology, I like, you know, lots of travel, culture, food, all the, a lot of different things. So yes, it was definitely part of it. But, um, you know, whenever you do a job, you should be able, it, would, it, it is nice to think that you can parlay all the other aspects of your personality and the things you like into that job. You can bring those things in. And that's another thing I encourage my staff to do. If, you like, if they like to draw, if they like to, they're welcome to, to do that for our social media, for even for our office walls and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's about me and you and what we like to do. So I guess the question is, you know, when it comes to things like accounts or marketing, you know, how do you know enough about the accounts to be able to actually give, you know, to be act actually be able to see what's right and what's wrong? Same thing with the marketing. Are these areas that you have kind of consciously tried to cultivate your knowledge of or is your knowledge more, um, you know, baseline with those things? Uh, no, I spend as much time learning those things every day as almost as much time as seeing patients. And I do it on the weekends. I, you know, I work a lot off the record, not seeing patients, learning these things, you know. Not off the record here, I mean, off the record seeing patients outside of my office. You know, and our journals are um, about, you know, the, the aspects of the practice, but then I'm also reading, my accountant provides me with information. You know, I'm re looking and seeing what my successful competitors are doing in terms of marketing. I have marketing agencies and PR agencies from time to time, and I learn from them. It's all a process and it, you kind of learn as you go along. And if you stop learning, you won't grow. So you have to keep learning. So tell me a, bit, a little bit about your marketing. What's the marketing thing that's worked best for you? Or worked Definitely Instagram. Instagram. Definitely Instagram. Well, what, what are you doing on Instagram that is working so amazingly? What's the key to success there? We're careful with our hashtags. We like to use ones that are pop, that are, you know, that people are searching and that are popular. The demographic is kind of who I want to cultivate as my, the future clients of my practice or even the current ones. Um, in the past, I did a lot of PR and I used to, you know, it used to be that being in the magazines and the print magazines all the time was very important, but I saw that as the Instagram of the past. Now we can do this without having to pay so much money for a PR firm and, you know, but I still, from my PR connections, I still have a lot of friends who are writers for the digital 
uh, aesthetic industry. And so I'm quoted often in that. And then that gets to be amplified on uh, Instagram. And then, of course, we also do Facebook for kind of our older clientele. And I do LinkedIn and all those other things. I think you found me on LinkedIn, right? That's right. Yeah. So, so we did. So, you know, the different platforms are good for different things. So, you know, you found me on LinkedIn and now I put this podcast on my Instagram and it's all very, it's interconnected. It all, it all helps in different ways. So, um, so other than social media, that's, that's essentially what's working well for you. What is the thing that you think in terms of marketing has been most overrated? Ah, that's tough. I don't want to say anything bad about anybody, but well, um, it's overrated for you, but not for someone else. So this is a very personal. That's true. That's, that's true because, um, you know, for aesthetic dermatology, our procedures are quick, they're small, they're with little recovery, they're not this giant decision. For plastic surgeons, they have to, you know, they have to get a patient to do a procedure that they may only do once in their life or twice in their life at the most. So I think advertising for them is much more important than it is paid advertising is much more important for them than it is for, for me. So for, the, for me, the things that I think don't work are those advertisements in the malls or on bus stops or in billboards that, you know, but I do understand that they might be very valuable for people who do larger big ticket procedures. They're more about getting your name out there, but it's very hard to book off a, you know, off, off a, a, an ad on a bus stop or on a mall, isn't it? So it's a different type of, it's a different type of approach. I think that they really need what they call the three hit theory of advertising, where someone recommends them to the patient, then the patient might Google them, and then they see them on the bus stop. So, you know, the three hits. But for a smaller procedure-based practice like mine, for Botox, if their friend tells them, oh, go see Dr. J for Botox, that's all they need. They don't need all three hits. Well, what's your biggest marketing challenge? I guess being seen, you know, search engine visibility is the most, right now is the thing that I probably spend the most time learning because Google is constantly telling us they're changing their algorithm. And then you said, see, are they really changing it? Have they changed it? When are they changing it? So I, I'd say definitely the most amount of reading I do is on search engine visibility right now. It's very hard to become a, a real expert in SEO. So I, my hat, hat's off to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure you could give me lots of pointers. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so that's, so that's the biggest um, marketing challenge that you have. Where are most of your patients from? Um, you know, they start out from being word of mouth referrals. And then um, that was, you know, for the, it still goes on. It's still an ongoing thing. By far, it's word of mouth referrals. But what people do is they see it's a two hit thing. So they, they hear from their friend and then they always go and look on Instagram or they Google. And if there's absolutely nothing there, you're going to be less likely to see that patient as a new patient. So you worry about differentiation in your marketing at all? I try really hard to differentiate. I, one thing is the diversity thing, which I think helps me because there's not so many darker skinned um, board certified dermatologists doing as focusing on aesthetic work in Miami right now. And also, um, you know, it's my education. I have, you know, I have sort of a double Ivy League education, which I think is, is good. It tells people I'm a solid person. Um, <laughs> what was, how, do you, how do you bring those things out in your, in your public image? In your, in your... Um, you know, they're in all of our, my bios and they're on, you know, on the internet. Um, the other differentiating thing that I think I did a lot earlier, but it's not so differentiating now, is that I don't overdo my patients work. So I'm big on the natural look. So people never look different. They just look a, like a better version of themselves. And that's now popular and it's not a differentiator. But 10 years ago, when I started saying it and putting it out there, yeah, it really was a differentiator. People were not doing that. People were overblowing everybody's lips. That was the, the right thing to do. And so, you know, now what I tell people is my lasers, if you do my lasers, religiously, you'll never need a surgery so that you don't have to worry about looking different. That's my new differentiator. Let's try to prevent surgery. 
So what, um, o- over the years, lots of, you know, obviously you've seen lots of treatments come, lots of treatments go. Um, what, what have you found works particularly well? Oh, I love, I love the skin tightening lasers. I think that they're the single best thing that's happened to our industry in the last decade. Um, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years, it was the injectables, Botox and filler. Now it's the skin tightening lasers because they enhance the results of the injectables to the extent that you don't need the injectables as much as often. And then what they also do is wait right at the point when you hit sort of your late 40s to early 50s and the injectables aren't working as well or you don't, you know, they're not doing the job they used to do. If you add some laser, then it takes you back to the point when you look just as good as a little bit of Botox did for you at 40. So it's huge. Uh, and what, what's coming up in terms of treatments that you're particularly excited about? I really like non-surgical body contouring because Miami, everybody's very concerned about how their body looks as much as their face. You know, we're, we're not covered up six months of the year. We're out there. So, you know, a lot of my patients um, want body work that's not going to give them a recovery, that they can wear a bikini afterward or, you know, go to the gym and well, not the gym now, but you know what I mean. Um, you know, they can work out and look good. They can go running outside and all that. So I'm really interested in developing the new lasers for body contouring and fat re- dissolving. And then there's a new product called Quo, which is a collagenase. It's an enzyme that sort of is an injectable that we can melt collagen with. And it's being launched to treat dimpled cellulite, which we had no treatment for before. Um, you know, that was easy and quick and didn't have a a lot of recovery. And I think there'll be other uses for it, which are going to be fascinating that we will find as time as we start using it. It's going to be interesting. You, you recently also launched your own skincare line. So tell me a little bit about that. What, what's, what's unique about that? What's exciting about that? Um, So I launched it with some very great investors and partners who've been very supportive and, you know, done a really nice job with the formulation. What I like about it, it it sort of has a unique story and a unique ingredient that nobody else is selling. It sort of targets the the progerin, which is a sort of a, what we call an upstream molecule for aging the skin. You know, it's not just about breaking down the vitamin C, so we replace the vitamin C, not just about breaking down the collagen, so we take a collagen supplement. It's more that it influences all these things. So if we replace that or if we inhibit that, then we can affect all of these things downstream. And so it's highly theoretical, but um, the creams are, are very popular and everybody seems to like them. They're selling very well and we have a lot of repeat customers. Are you selling them just to your clinic or you're now selling them into other clinics as well? No, it's actually sold from a completely different uh, avenue so that it's not related to my staff here because that would be another thing for them to do. It's sold exclusively online on Facebook and YouTube. So how did you come to develop this? So, um, you know, I, I, I get lots of different propositions all the time. And uh, so this was among them. And, you know, I've had lots of skincare lines come in and I like the product and, you know, things worked out. The timing was well. We launched right in the first week of the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, yeah, yeah, the timing couldn't have been better. So we'll see how it goes. Was there something completely different being on that side of things, developing a product? What were the challenges for you there? It, it's like having a second job. I mean, it's a completely different thing. I, I film, you know, very long 30 minute infomercials every month or so. And, you know, so that's really, in my opinion, helped me a lot with the things I wasn't doing well, such as preparing myself for, for video, you know, learning how to speak and, you know, even reading from a teleprompter, memorizing lines, you know, it's like a whole acting thing that, you know, I had never done before. And so it's learning a completely new skill. I, I really love it. And what's coming up next for you that you're, that you're excited about? Um, I would like, you know, we had talked about price and how, you know, my prices are high. Um, I would like to be able to be involved in a quality project that 
provides the, pro the procedures I do now, like Botox and maybe not filler, but some of the skin lasers and things like that, the, the, very, the more safe procedures that are um, you know, more easily done um, at good prices. So quality treatments at better prices, such as you know, just like the blow dry bars brought what they brought to hair care. You know, and now it's not an unusual thing to get a blowout every time you go out. You know, and that was never done in my day. You know, you only got a blowout for the prom once in your life, maybe. You know, so now I would like it so that people can go in the, you know, in their neighborhood strip mall because they're they're suffering now, uh, and be able to get a, a service like Botox and be able to trust it and know that it'll be done the same way every time, standardized. And so that's kind of the project I'm working on now is to try and get those kinds of things out there into retail. At, at, at good quality, because of course, all those treatments are available pretty much in every, every street corner, but right. you're not really sure of the quality. I think the problem with that is that they're not standardized. And the, the challenge is standardization so that in my office, they know they're gonna get the same thing every time and they're gonna be safe. So the challenge is to get that out there and you know, to make it possible in a chain or some sort of retail setting. And I think that's the future. And you know, no one thought 10 years ago that you could get a quality standardized massage, right? And now look at Massage Envy you know, or waxing and look at European Wax Center. And those are all standardized things now because of protocols. So looking back on the last really 20, 30 years of your, of your career and your practice, and really uh, the process of growing your practice. Um, if you were speaking, which you are really in this podcast, to other um, clinic owners who are maybe at an earlier stage, what is the one piece of advice that you would leave them with? The one single most important thing that you learned along the way? Um, take every interaction with every patient as if it was your only one. You know, treat every single patient the same um, and treat them well and be the best you can be in your procedures and you'll succeed. That's a lovely place to end. So first of all, thank you very much, um, Dr. Manjula Jagasothi. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, where can they do that? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, well, we need YouTube and Instagram followers. So please follow us. The name of my practice is Miami Skin Institute. So those, the YouTube channel is called that as well as the Instagram account. And you can DM us there or you can reach us on our office at our office anytime. And Miriam will post the phone number. Um, and that's, that's about it. And just tell me again, what's the name of your skincare line and where can they find details about that? Sure, it's called Miami MD and it's best, um, you know, you can buy it through Facebook and YouTube, but I think it's best approached through the website, which is miamimd.co, miamimd.co, not com. <laughs> Great. So um, as, as you said, I will put all those details and all those links in the show notes. So anyone who's listening to this, all you have to do is go to the bottom of this podcast and all the links will be there. Um, in the meanwhile, thank you very, very much um, for, for joining us. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and for everyone else, I will see you on the next episode of How I Scaled My Aesthetic Clinic. I'm Miriam Shaviv of Brainstorm Digital. Have a great day. Bye.